there's a YouTuber out there, um, goes by the name of the Modern Mystic, that in my interpretation of what he has to say, he goes by quite an uncompromising and fascinating species of pessimism. Now, I don't want to straw man him, and I, so I have to sort of say in advance here a little disclaimer um, that I don't make any claims to actually understanding what he's saying. Um, I'm just interpreting what he says in my own flawed way. The fascinating thing about his uh, modus operandi, or I wouldn't even say that, what I would say is the way he expresses himself, is the way that he deals with... <coughs> anything that isn't stark and uncompromisingly pessimistic um, usually falls under the heading of fairy dust. Now that's interesting because um, it, it seems to sort of categorize things as either correct or incorrect, and that's the uncompromising part. Um, fairy dust being just plain old incorrect, uh, just crap that uh, shouldn't be sort of taken into account at all because it's just illusion or rubbish or whatever. All right, I, I understand that point of view, and to a certain degree I agree with it. Um, but what <clears throat> what fascinates me is the potential for this kind of thinking to sort of overtake someone. I'm not saying that it has over overtaken the old mystic, I don't know, um, but I can see where this can actually happen. Um, pessimism is an interesting phenomenon, and it depends on how you approach the whole subject of pessimism um, and how you make it work for you as opposed to against you. Uh, a lot of people are just sick and tired of being told how wonderful the world is. Uh, I think that adolescents in particular are often, sadly, destroyed by this insistence that they're living through a wonder period in their life um, where everyone is telling them that everything is beautiful and fabulous and they're young and free and have their whole life ahead of them and everything and they're living in a rather ordinary life a rather unremarkable place and they seem to develop a healthy disregard for um, absurd optimism now I think most of us sort of develop that balance sort of as part, part of the maturing process, luckily. It's often an extremely painful process where you learn not to let optimism take over because it's unrealistic and it sets you up for some really horrible falls in life. Uh, you have to climb to a great height in order to fall very far. <clears throat> now, pessimism is a skill... Um, as opposed to a position. Now, this is the way I see pessimism. This is my bias. You have to sort of imagine pessimism as one of your own tools that you're using to deal with um, reality or to deal with the reality of your own mind and your own self. <clears throat> I think existential panic it can often result in uh, the sudden realization that a lot of your um, a lot of the edifice that you've built your world into, a lot of the, the a lot of your worldview might be shaky and untenable, and that it could collapse at any moment. And this is where I think a certain degree of controlled pessimism can actually assist you. If you sort of have this la 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 la, life is beautiful, and I don't want to listen to any anything to the contrary. And we've all seen that this. There's a huge streak of this in our culture, um, you sort of, a way of counteracting that is a healthy sense of pessimism, a healthy sense of saying that's just rubbish and I don't trust that. Now, what happens is though, in some cases, I think people sort of lose control of their own pessimism. They lose the sense of initiative of saying, aha, over-optimism over here. Okay, so I'm just going to take a little bit of pessimism and put it on that side of the scale. Things are back in balance. Things are normal. 
i think what happens is people see the world as an endless series of it tempts to make them believe things to make them believe that life is beautiful when quite demonstrably it isn't <clears throat> so they go a little bit too far the other way and you tend to just sort of dismiss things in a, an angry kind of way or a completely cynical sort of way this is toxic pessimism rather than saying that yes I don't want to go too far in one direction and I want to counterbalance this crazy optimism with a healthy pessimism um, pessimism itself gets into the driver's seat and starts to drive the car with you just as a passenger now this is when pessimism ceases to become or ceases to be rather your servant and is now your master uh, and this can result in a distorted sense of reality uh, I call that the depressed state <laughs> um, I'm not a psychologist at all and I make no claims to having any answers to depression or anything like that but this is simply part of the means by which I've trained myself to cope with depression you don't want to give up on pessimism because pessimism seems to make sense in light of the fact that you flip the TV on and you see a commercial for a pharmaceutical company and it's a bunch of happy people cutting flowers and running along a beach and this sort of thing and you sort of think that's bullshit I don't believe in that view of the world so probably something that is not that is closer to reality now some people at that point I think they just sort of say let's go the other way um, when they see this hooray for everything attitude um, and it's just down with everything uh, everything is crap uh, everything is um, fairy dust uh, and you're no longer in control of the situation in the same way as if you're the person who gets hooked into and believes in all of this mind control stuff that you see whenever you pick up a magazine, turn on the TV, uh, heaven forbid, go to church, whatever, where everyone is telling you that everything is wonderful and you suspect the opposite. The, you know, they're the classic case of uh, suburban mind rot where you drive through a suburban neighborhood and everything looks neat and clean and everything but you're quite certain that so and so over here is cooking up uh, crystal meth in his garage and the other guy is having an affair uh, with his neighbor's wife on his own wife or maybe with his neighbor's husband a la American Beauty or whatever you sort of think that something is rotten here so rather than sort of seeing that this is just another place with another set of variables that's no better or no worse than anywhere else you tend to sort of think suburbia is some kind of hell unfortunately that has that, that view of suburbia has crept into my mind and I couldn't I, I can't drive through a cookie cutter subdivision without shuddering a bit now, that's just an aside but in other words I'm not saying that I'm immune to this kind of knee-jerk pessimism either <clears throat> but you have to make sure that pessimism is being employed as a tool and it's not being employed as a fetter um, in other words you have to be in control of your pessimism and this is how I tend to deal with as I say the the, the issue of things like existential panic um, you look around inside your mind and you see the dragon in there you go, okay what's that what is it that that dragon is actually going to destroy is, is actually threatening is that horrible monstrous dragon threatening me or is he threatening a ridiculously over optimistic view of life the universe and everything um, I tend to see him or I tend to try to see him as the latter uh, because some people seem to be at peace with the imperfect world that we see around us and they don't they're not ruled by the fears that others are apparently ruled by um, and such people as you'll, you'll also generally notice don't tend to get horribly enthusiastic about everything uh, my father seems to be just such a person he doesn't get 
his mind blown by any sense of ecstatic joy. I actually asked him once, has anyone ever blown your mind, Dad? And he goes, no. And I laughed because I remember thinking, yes, I know, you've got an unblowable mind. It, it, <laughs> your mind just doesn't work like that. But my father also doesn't get too terribly shaken up when something catastrophic happens. Now, some people might think that that's a state of sterility, but uh, or just sort of blah, you know, no color. And I guess to a certain extent that's justified. But, you know, again, you, most people have colorful characters. You just have to know how to see it. You just have to know how to see the color in their character and the, the variations. So it's not so much that it's an either-or thing in terms of optimism and pessimism. Um, because if we reject optimism in favor of pessimism, you, you get uh, something equally toxic. As I said, the, 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 de the depressed person is often someone who has been overcome by negativity and pessimism. Um, which they may have actually come across in a healthy way. Um, they may have sort of said, look, I, I can't believe in all the horse shit I'm being fed. Um, it's, it's, it's too much for me. I, you know, I, I, I don't believe in it at all. That's healthy. But when you decide that I'm just going to go the opposite way and hand the initiative of my life over to the opposite of ridiculous optimism, that's equally unhealthy and unbalanced, um, because the result, of course, is depression. The, re the result is an equally unrealistic view of things, um, an equally, shall we say, slavish view of things. Rather than being a slave to optimism, you have consciously or subconsciously become a slave to pessimism. Um, Again, the, to, you know, the old metaphor, uh, I first came across this in, uh, in the original Star Trek where Mr. Spock says about this supercomputer, computers make wonderful servants, but I have no desire to serve under them. Um, I would say that optimism and pessimism are, um, are to be seen in much the same way. Um, they are wonderful. You, know, you, you can bring optimism to your uh, rescue, as it were, if you're getting a little bit too gloomy about things, or if you find yourself in a particularly gloomy situation, um, you can sort of just remind yourself, it's just the circumstances that I'm in that are gloomy, and if I get out of these circumstances, then I won't be gloomy and unbalanced anymore. And then by the same token, you can sort of, the next time somebody tries to say, buy these, uh, this product of mine and your life will be just wonderful, um, you can just sort of say, ah, can I have a little bit of pessimism over there? Uh, that guy, that ridiculous optimism is unbalancing me. <laughs> um, uh, rather than developing a knee-jerk um, view that whatever you believe you're being fed, the opposite is true. You've got to make up your own mind in, inside your own mind, how you view things. Um, and if you hand the initiative over to excessive optimism or excessive pessimism, uh, then you've lost that initiative. You're no longer in control. You're no longer in control of, of what's going on up here. Um, I mentioned in my previous video that uh, experience is ultimately what matters. Um, we can't control what's going on around us in a lot of cases. We can't. We can't. It's not up to me to prevent a bunch of hijacked airliners from crashing into the World Trade Center and traumatizing the world. There's not a great deal I can do about that. <clears throat> what I can do is control my experience of it. I have a certain degree of control over that. You saw some people who actually handled that quite well. Um, it, in, in, a <clears throat> in a propaganda sense, it was handled quite well once the original shock sort of wore off by people who said, okay, what everybody wants now is confidence and um, a belief that this is being handled effectively. So the politicians all lined up and said, yes, we are handling this, and um, we have a job to do, we intend to do it, and the public may rest assured. We're still not out of the danger, but you are in good hands, which is your pessimism being manipulated, which is, which is you know, your the initiative in your life being taken from you. Um, whereas if you sort of 
are in control of your own experience of things that you can see ok a building went down a plane crashed into it large number of people died a truly horrible and uh, catastrophic manner we don't know if there's going to be other ones coming along and the world has gotten completely out of hand here I have to still whether it's easy or not make sense out of this inside my own brain otherwise I've lost control I've lost control of my own experiences my own reactions to the outside world um, I've got to sort of get a realistic and um, tenable sustainable view of this um, it's bad but worse things could have happened um, I still live in a time and an age when I probably won't be uh, dragged off and enslaved by a bunch of marauding barbarians which was a realistic possibility in much of human history I still live in a time where it's virtually impossible for me to starve to death or at least a place where it's virtually impossible for me to starve to death this sort of thing a little bit of optimism helps keep you from getting too uh, far into the pessimism by the same token <clears throat> which is something I mentioned adolescence every adolescent I think has to learn you fall madly in love head over heels completely unrealistically and one of several things happens you get what you want you get that person and slowly and insidiously over time <clears throat> you realize that you had a very real unrealistic view of this person rather than being some sort of superman superwoman whatever that was going to turn your life into a living paradise you realize this is just another flesh and blood human being just like yourself and you feel betrayed and angry but you don't really know what to what to do about that <clears throat> which is pretty bad it's a quite a disillusioning process um, and it can create a lot of rot in your mind about your view of fellow human beings and about yourself of course why why should any you know I know that I'm not perfect why the hell should anyone else be perfect um, or the <clears throat> even more sort of short-term <clears throat> excuse me catastrophic thing happens <laughs> you, you get the door slammed in your face and <laughs> oh boy that's hard uh, that's when you you're walking on sunshine and suddenly you're cast face first into the pit of deepest despair like often like that it happens so fast a little bit of pessimism might have actually helped to prevent that from happening along the way uh, a little bit of pessimism would help right things but what happens when you keep things off balance like that um, and unfortunately this is something that I think has to be learned through experience which is why I'm picking on teenagers here um, you sort of set yourself up for an almighty fall by abandoning your initiative to an excessive optimism you abandon uh, your sense of control over your life to something just as bad as an excessive pessimism um, the excessive pessimism uh, can lead you to depression, unrealistic view of the world, fundamentally negative, writing everything off uh, that could be worthy and of value in your life as complete garbage. Um, and excessive optimism, well, we know what happens there because you simply ignore the, the landmines that are out there. And, of course, once you step on one, you can be destroyed by them. And this is something that... I have to point out is not something that's inherent in the world I suppose the world just is whether or not we're optimistic or pessimistic about it is entirely up to us <clears throat> whether or not we keep those two in balance is up to us and I'm not talking about a middle position here of abandoning optimism and pessimism I don't think that I'm quite at the stage where I can abandon both but I can at least play the one off against the other um, I can at least sort of say when excessive optimism comes along my pessimistic side comes to the rescue to right the ship and the same thing happens when an excessive optimism comes along that's sort of the optimism and pessimism have to be to a certain degree played off against each other to keep a realistic view of the world 
because of how much of the world is beyond our control. I have no control over this person that I've fallen madly in love with. I have no control over what they're going to do once I've handed that kind of initiative uh, over to complete chance. Um, and it's not so much that love is actually a bad thing, which is unfortunately what a lot of people conclude when they fail horribly and perhaps repeatedly at the love game, um, but it's just that you mustn't let it control you. Uh, it's the same thing as not letting your pessimism control you. All of this takes place internally. All of this takes place at the existential level. All of this takes place um, in terms of qualia, in terms of experience of reality. And as I said, what, distinguishing, what distinguishes that from blind optimism or life is wonderful is the fact that you have some control over this. Um, you have some control over how you perceive things, which is not uh, to the same extent true of the outside world. I have very little control of, over what's going on in the outside world, but I do have a certain degree of control over what's going on internally and in the values and judgments that I place on the outside world. Um, that's why I think that developing a knee-jerk pessimism is just as toxic and dangerous as a knee-jerk optimism. Um, what's going on outside is not something that we really can control. We can only control our experiences of what's going on outside. Um, and if you're going to hand your well-being to things that are beyond your control, uh, well, I think we can predict what a result might be. 